Welcome to the first ever Walk With Us Forum presented to you by the Australian Olympic Committee. I am honoured to be your host this evening. My name is Tanisha Stanton and I'm a proud Gamilaro Uralaro woman whose family hails from Central West and Northwest New South Wales. I'm currently working at the ABC as a sports presenter and producer, but I have a deep love for sport after representing my country and state in various sports. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands that you are joining us from tonight. I'm hosting this forum on Gadigal country. I pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, to all of our Olympians, aspiring Olympians and special guests that are joining us tonight. I welcome you on behalf of the AOC's Indigenous Advisory Committee and thank you for attending this inaugural Walk With Us Forum. To kick things off, please welcome Olympians, Patty Mills, followed by Kate Campbell for their acknowledgements of country. I grew up thinking that I wanted to be like Kathy Freeman and I want to represent our culture like Kathy Freeman did and wave the flag as proud as she did. My name is Patrick Mills. I come from the Kokoda people of the far west coast of South Australia. My name comes from my grandfather, of the Nagyal people of Nagi Island, Torres Strait. And I am a Meriam man of the Dawareb tribes, Eastern Islands, Torres Strait, where the Great Barrier Reef begins, far north Queensland. To start today's acknowledgement of country, I would like to introduce my uncle Michael, elder of the Kokoda people of South Australia, and also my grandfather, Alo Tapin, Meriam Elder of the Dawareb tribe, to conduct our official virtual Welcome to Country. Ngai ko ini makal nya, ngai lo mura sedyan langro, ano na poker ba, nundo, manda nyananga, naranyi, paya. Kamer kamer krim le wo really, able do day de, obi mayem di kere. I am a proud Australian and I practice culture on a daily basis. I'm a proud husband and the longest tenured member of the NBA San Antonio Spurs, but perhaps most honorably, a three-time Olympian who is deeply rooted and passionate about the green and gold. I'll never forget the long wait in the stands of that gymnastic stadium, followed by the long walk through the intense humidity to finally arrive at the tunnel of the bird's nest, my first ever Olympic Games opening ceremony, 2008. I was only 19 years at the time. I had my 20th birthday there, so I was still very young and still, you know, obviously learning the ropes of, of playing international basketball. Walking through the tunnel behind the great James Tonkins, I will never forget the feeling that I got to hear the roar of the entire Australian team in that tunnel that night, right as the announcer said, Australia. We entered the bird's nest to another roar from the crowd as we walked onto the track. It's an unbelievably powerful feeling representing my country at the Olympic Games. It's a way bigger feeling than anything that I've experienced before in my life including the 2014 NBA Championships. But I'll deny saying this if anyone from San Antonio asks. The opportunity to be a part of the Olympic Games isn't just about great memories and representing your country in sport. It's a responsibility and I take it seriously. I am very honoured to be one of the 52 Indigenous Australian athletes that have represented Australia at the Olympics and I'm very committed to creating opportunities and pathways to make those numbers rise in the future, especially within the game of basketball. My parents dedicated their careers, more than 50 years to this cause, working within the Australian government and creating pathways to better indigenous life in Australia. Their resumes, truly unbelievable. Now, I may not be able to put on a suit and tie and develop the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People in Geneva every day like my dad, but through sport, this is my way of doing my part. I love my country and I love our culture. It's not just my passion, it's in my blood. I could not be more excited to represent the green and gold at the 2021 Olympics. So until then, Tokyo together, 
The countdown has already started. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands in which I live and train, the Durag people of the Gurungai Nation. I also extend this acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on the lands on which we all live and meet here today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the 52 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Olympians who have competed and who continue to compete in the spirit of the Olympic Games. It's beautiful. Thank you so much, Patty Mills and Kate Campbell, for your respective acknowledgements of country and welcome to country. I would like to, at this time, acknowledge NAIDOC celebrations that are happening across the country this week. The theme this year is always was, always will be. NAIDOC is an opportunity for everyone to celebrate the rich history, culture, achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Walk with us. That's the theme of tonight's event. We will hear about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history, discuss the challenges of reconciliation, and hopefully inspire and support you as athletes to show leadership in your respective sports and communities on behalf of Australia's First Nations people, which you represent. This is a safe space, and we invite you all on a journey into the history of the First Nations people a journey that encourages Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians to acknowledge our true history and an invitation to walk side by side on a reconciliation journey towards the future. We have an incredible list of panel members and guests that are gonna be joining us tonight. We'll be joined by Indigenous Olympian and Chair of the AOC's Indigenous Advisory Committee, Patrick Johnson, Indigenous Olympians, Kyle Vanderkite, Becky Smith and Denny Morsu, Olympian and Chair of the AOC Athletes Commission, Steve Hooker, special guests, journalist Stan Grant and Director of From the Heart, Dean Parkin. Tonight's forum will be presented, well, sorry, rather be presented in three different parts. Yarn one, where we'll acknowledge the past. Yarn two, where we'll come together in the present. And yarn three, where we'll walk together in the future. This is an incredible opportunity of present. This is also an incredible opportunity for you guys to ask any questions to our panel members that we have a bit later. And if you've also come into this forum with any questions, please post them in the live chat. We want to hear from you because um, we're here for you guys to tonight to deliver any messages that you need. And it's also important for us to acknowledge the man that brought this all together, who plays an integral role in creating this forum, Patrick Johnson, Olympian and Chair of the AOC's Indigenous Advisory Committee. He's gonna welcome you all tonight. Thank you, Tanisha. Uh, first of all, I too like to welcome everyone as a proud country man, proud Olympian and a proud Australian, and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land wherever you are in this great country of Australia, and if you're tuning in, of course, from overseas, uh, I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Knowledge, my fellow Olympians and, of course, aspiring Olympians, Tokyo 2020 officials and, of course, special guests today. Uh, welcome to our first ever Walk With Us Forum. Uh, these are the first steps of the Australian Olympic Committee's reconciliation journey that acknowledge, recognise and celebrates Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander history, culture within the Olympic movement. I also like to acknowledge our first Indigenous Olympians uh, in the 1964 Tokyo Games that have created the pathway for all our current 52 Indigenous Olympians and aspiring Olympians to the Olympic movement. I now would like to share with you a very special video that has been created by the Australian Olympic Committee. This video celebrates, recognises the 52 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Olympians who competed and continue to compete in the spirit of the Olympic Games. But before we play the video, I would like to first acknowledge um, the recent passing of John Kessler, uh, an Aboriginal leader, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, John was one of our first Indigenous Olympians who competed in two Olympic Games in wrestling, 68 Mexico and the 1972 Munich Games. Our thoughts are with John's family and the community, and we also remember others that we have lost from our Olympic family. Let's take a moment uh, to honour and celebrate our 52 Indigenous Olympians now.
carried my Aboriginal flag with me and had it in my room. And I never got to do the Cathy Freeman and run around the track with it, but I always say to people, hey, it wasn't, it wasn't political um, statement that I had it in my room. It was, that's my identity. That's, that's my ancestry. That's my history. represent my people, I was very, very proud of that. Set your goals high and work hard. Be disciplined, have the right attitude, focus on your dreams and aspirations to be the greatest sportsman you can be. I was going over the finish line and I remember thinking to myself, so this is what it feels like to be an, an Olympic champion. I feel very lucky that they have paved the way to make my journey that little bit easier to become an Indigenous Olympian. And it inspires me to hopefully do that for our future Indigenous Olympians as well. It's quite simple and it was just to believe in my dream. Um, I believe that I could become an Olympian even when others didn't and not really knowing how but it was that that true inner belief in myself and in my dream that helped me clear the path and show me the way and honouring what we have to say as First Nations people. What a powerful and deadly piece that was. Amazing images of some inspiring Olympians throughout the years. We're now going to move on to our first yarn for this evening, acknowledging the past. Tonight we'll be discussing the history of our First Nations peoples, the pain that these histories have caused and the transformation of that pain from generation to generation. This discussion, mutual recognition and understanding of our shared history is an important first step for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous Australians as well, as we set the foundation for which we can move forward together. Joining us live this evening for our first yarn, we have Patrick Johnson, welcome back. From our Melbourne studio, we have dual Olympian, champion of the reconciliation plan, and also the member of the Indigenous Advisory Committee, Carl Van der Kuyp, and Steve Hooker, Olympian and chair of the AOC's Athletes Commission, all the way from the Torres Strait, we have dual Olympian and basketball champion and AOC's of the Re champion of the AOC's Reconciliation Action Plan, Danny Morsu, welcome. And joining me here in the Sydney studio is Olympian, Indigenous Advisory Committee member and also mentor for AIM organisation, Becky Smith. Becky, welcome to you and welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Honoured to be here, thank you. So great to have you all here. Kyle, I'm going to go to you for the first question. We seen earlier in the presentation, there was an acknowledgement of country and a welcome to country as well from uh, Patty Mills and Kate Campbell. Can you just please give our audience some context around the difference between the two? Yeah, thanks, Tanisha. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to Patty Mills and Kate Campbell for giving us a welcome to country and also acknowledgement of country. But there's a st distinct difference between the both. So when you see a welcome to country, that's done by an elder. And Paddy had his elders, he had his uncles do that welcome to country from the Torres Strait. And we also heard some special language from the Torres Strait. So when you get a welcome, it's done by an elder. You'll have to go and find the right appropriate elder in that space that you're in or, or across that country that you're on. But when you do an acknowledgement, anyone can have a go at that. And I'm, I'm 
I'm seeing that happen more and more across Australia. So major events, football, NRL, we're seeing acknowledgement. We're also seeing welcome and traditional dance. So yeah, that's the two differences I wanted to let the audience know about. When you see a welcome, that's done by an elder. And when you see an acknowledgement, that can be done by anyone. So yeah, have a go and well done to Kate because she did a beautiful acknowledgement of country um, on Darug land on North Shore. So thanks, Kate. Steve, I'm going to throw to you now as the chair of the AOC's Athletes Commission. There's been cross representation between the Athletes Commission and also the Indigenous Advisory Committee. As a non-Indigenous man, how important has it been for you to be part of this committee and what have been some highlights for you so far? Yeah, thanks, Tanisha. It's been an absolute privilege, really, to sit in on the Indigenous Advisory Committee meetings as they work on the important role they play within um, the AOC's mission to promote reconciliation through sport. Um, the highlights for me, the first one has been yeah. this forum. Um, I, I personally felt um, really underprepared when Black Lives Matter um, came to light this year. Uh, I felt like I didn't have the knowledge or the language to use around those key issues, particularly when I looked at how it re uh, related to the Australian environment and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So off the back of that, I, I called Patrick Johnson and I, I, I spoke about that and we both agreed that other Olympians might have the same feelings of inadequacy or, or um, a lack of education. So we came um, together around this idea of a forum to inform Olympians on these issues, to give them the confidence to speak on these issues and become advocates for change. Um, the other um, uh, thing that's been amazing to work with um, the Indigenous Advisory Committee on has been our Australian Olympians Oath. Um, the Athletes Commission ran a long process, a really consultative process, where we sought the feedback of all Australian Olympians on what they would like to see in an oath that they thought represented them best. And we received a lot of feedback, including feedback from Indigenous Olympians. Um, we put together an oath that was ready to go and be launched at the Tokyo Olympics. And since my involvement with the Indigenous Advisory Committee, I realised and it became blatantly obvious that there was no acknowledgement of our First Nations people. Um, it made it blatantly clear and uh, I brought that to this group and, and with my apologies and the apologies of the rest of the Athletes Commission and was welcomed with open arms and um, has since then been working with the group on creating an appropriate recognition of our First Nations people. And I think now we have an oath that really respects that and embraces that and creates a fantastic foundation for our entire Australian Olympic team and group of Olympians to become um, owners of this, owners of this rich history that we all share um, and to become really um, strong advocates for change as a result of it. So I'm excited now to stop talking and listen to all your stories tonight. Can't wait. That's incredible though, Steve, and I can't wait for our Olympians to hear that oath for themselves at Tokyo. Patrick, I'm going to throw to you now. A lot of Olympians are backing this forum. Steve Hooker and the AOC Athletes Commission, yourself and the AOC Indigenous Advisory Committee. Can you just give our audience a bit of background on how this idea come to fruition and also the meaning behind the theme? walk with us yeah thank you I think you know we have a shared history and you know shared moments of sport and life and a shared future and uh, it was really significant uh, when of course Steve rang me uh, and just to have a talk and you know to ask those questions because if you don't ask you, you never learn and I, I believe you know the to, to represent but also acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture um, in this country's history is really important as, a, as an Olympian and I feel that it's not separate for what we do because we're proud to represent our country, uh, represent our sport and represent our family. Um, so it was a great opportunity to have that synergy. Uh, and of course, having the Athletes Commission involved with Steve was, it was a, a no-brainer in the sense because we are Olympians. Uh, and we love our sport and we love representing our country. So to share this journey, um, to have that representation, but also have that celebration and acknowledgement, uh, everyone shares in this. Uh, it's a win-win for everyone and I'm really proud to be a part of this, but it's also, we can't do this alone. Uh, we have to do it as a collective uh, and we have to ask those questions that sometimes might be, you might feel vulnerable, um, but it's really important to ask those questions because um, we're in this together, not only as the Olympic family, but also uh, representing the Olympic movement um, in this great country of Australia. And Danny, it's great to have a Torres Strait Islander representation on this forum. And it's also important for our audience to understand that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander refers to two, two different groups of people. Can you please tell us a little bit about your Torres Strait Islander culture and how your culture is different from Australia's Aboriginals? 
Absolutely, Tanisha. Before I start, I just want to say, Mayem, Saungapa. Welcome everybody from Thursday Island and Torres Strait. Debeki, Kapukubil. Good evening, everybody. Our culture uh, is very unique and different from Aboriginal people on the mainland. The Dari is the headdress on our flag that represents the Torres Strait, and the five stars in between represent the five island group of the Torres Strait. Torres Strait people are seafarers, hunters, gatherers, and gardeners. And my family have, have very strong ties throughout the Torres Strait. And in particular, I guess probably the inner islands uh, and uh, the eastern islands of the Torres Strait and the western islands, where I have very strong ties there. I'm from the eastern islands of the Torres Strait, Kerem Kerem, Miriam Nation, Dawar Reb. And in the, I, I was born and grew up in the inner islands of the Torres Strait, which is the uh, Kawalagal, Kararig Aboriginal Nation. And thirdly, the Western, uh, Western Islands of the Torres Strait, which represent uh, Badu and the Inner Western. Uh, my family come from uh, also Mabiogal and, and Badu in the Torres Strait. And we're Wagadagam mob from that area. And the Central Islands, uh, Kalkalgal Nation. And the top Western uh, is also consist of Saibai Bugu and also Duan. The, um, there are two common languages spoken in the Torres Strait. Uh, Kalalagaya and Muriume. We have five different dialects uh, which are also spoken in the Torres Strait. English wasn't our first language growing up in the Torres Strait. It was uh, a pigeon uh, was, I guess, probably the key one where we used to actually communicate with families across the Torres Strait. I was Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Denny. It's been it's so important for our for our audience to know this distinction between the two. Becky, I'm going to come to you now. As we mentioned earlier, um, you're a member of the AOC's Indigenous Advisory Committee. As a current athlete, how is important is it that you are a part of that committee? And also, how, what does it mean for you to have a voice? Yeah, thanks, T. Um, it's absolutely amazing to be a part of the committee. It's something that gives me the opportunity as a current athlete to contribute to meaningful change. And that's kind of a rare opportunity for us athletes to get while we're still competing or training. So it's very special and something that I, I don't take um, for granted at all. Um, it's a huge honor. It's really, really hard to put into words, um, I guess, just what I've experienced so far on the committee and, and working with the AAC and, and the rest of the committee members. But I think, you know, it makes me a better human. It makes me a better mum, a better athlete. It takes me out of that athlete bubble that we're that we're so used to being in and it makes me think that there's more to this world than sport and myself and giving back to community always gives me so much energy and inspiration and you know I guess that's why we do what we do. Incredible incredible okay there's been some great conversations so far when now we're going to touch on some points of discussion around history trauma disadvantage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people before we continue our discussion. We're now gonna play an educational video. It's been provided by Healing Foundation on Indigenous history and intergenerational trauma. I would like to reiterate that this is a safe space and that we're not trying to overwhelm you um, with what is going to be a heavy discussion. But in saying that, it's important that everyone understands the true history of this country. Please be aware that the following video may cause sadness or distress for viewers. Uh, and we advise that the content has been made for an adult audience. So if you have children um, under the age of 18, please make sure they're supervised. The story of our communities, people and nation starts a long, long time ago. More than 60,000 years, in fact. This was when our culture and our law first started to thrive. We knew who we were and where we belonged. We took care of each other, our land, 
and our waters. We ate food that made us healthy, lived on country and abided by our laws and song lines. Our families, our children were happy with strong minds and hearts because they were where they belonged. But then, everything changed. Colonisation came, bringing wars, disease, famine, violence, and the destruction and violation of our cultural laws, sacred sites, families, and communities. We were denied our knowledge, language, ceremonies, and identity. The very things that tell us who we are and where we belong and our connections with each other and the land grew weak. And then our children were taken from us. They had their names changed and their identities stripped away. They were told that Aboriginal people were bad. Worse still, they were told that their parents and grandparents did not want them. For years this happened and those children became known as the Stolen Generations. Our children were denied love and experienced physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. This left very deep, very complex, and very real wounds, leaving scars that are still being felt personally, socially, spiritually, and collectively. In the time when our story started, we were able to parent in the cultural way that has seen our family survive and thrive for generations. Our people were strong, and our culture flowed and healed us in times of hurt. But since the trauma of colonisation and the stolen generations, we have not been able to heal in the same way. And we have unknowingly passed this trauma on to our children through sharing our sad stories and having them witness and experience our pain. This is known as intergenerational trauma, and we see symptoms today in broken relationships, disconnected families, violence, suicide, and drug and alcohol abuse. But this is not where our story ends. We still have strong minds and hearts, and we still know who we were and where we belong by creating safe and strong communities together, supporting our families to be free from pain, returning to our culture and building a strength of identity. We can stop the cycle of trauma and bring about positive intergenerational change so that we can continue to thrive for the next 60,000 years. There are simple things that we can all do to help heal our trauma. It's hard to watch that video as the pain, it still lives very deep within all of us. As you've just seen, the vision can help develop an understanding for you all that if we don't have the opportunity to heal from our past trauma, we may unknowingly pass it on to others, including our children. Kyle, I'm gonna come to you for our, our first question again. Um, when you, back when you were competing at the Olympic Games, what are some of the difference that, differences you've seen since then in terms of awareness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history? Oh, I think a lot's changed in the country. I mean, I think of my career through the 90s and it's only as I've left sport and now started to become aware that I realised the Mabo decision. Um, I realised the um, Paul Keating speech in Redfern in 1992. Um, so many significant things that our country went through in the 90s. And I go to Sydney Olympics and I see such a beautiful ceremony and see you know, Indigenous culture celebrated, um, embraced, um, all of our country came together at that, that great moment and, and celebrated who we are. And, and now 20 years later, I see, you know, so much changing in our education system, um, employment. Um, I'm, I'm in that space at the moment and I'm seeing, you know, a lot more opportunities for Indigenous people. But that video really, it's, it's important to watch because it shows where we've come from and it shows some of that that trauma, as you've mentioned, it shows some of the impacts and consequences that, that, that have happened to Indigenous people. So you really have to understand that to know 
why we have so many programs for Indigenous people, why there's a focus on employment, why there's a focus on education. So I've seen a lot of change and I've got a lot of great hope because I can see that we're, we're not just doing this together. You know, that's what Indigenous people want. We, want. we want support around this. It should be the whole country's concern that we have um, you know, people incarcerated at, at way too higher levels, um, that we have unemployment levels way too high. So I, um, they're the things that I'm passionate about now and I, I, can, I can have, you know, hold my heart and say I can see change happening. I, I see open hearts, I see Australia willing to walk with us and I mean, it's the theme of tonight, but I, I've seen it in the employment space. I've seen it in business space. Um, and now I'm seeing it in the sporting space as well. Um, we're opening our, our hearts to, to support Indigenous people. Incredible. Danny, we discussed before the differences between Aboriginal history and Torres Strait Islander history. From your perspective, can you please provide the audience with some insight um, on how history and intergenerational trauma has affected our Torres Strait Islander people? Uh, certainly, uh, Tanisha. The impact of colonisation has a dramatic impact on uh, the Torres Strait Islands economically, socially and culturally. Uh, Western society influence have an impact on our languages, song, dances, and we need to revive those uh, right throughout the country. Let me tell you a quick story. Uh, when I went to school uh, up in the Torres Strait, uh, we weren't allowed to speak our own language uh, in the school uh, and the playgrounds. Uh, and it happened right throughout our primary school and also our, our high school as well when I went through that. And uh, I felt that, you know, during this time, our human rights uh, were taken away from us, where we were actually put into uh, reservations, missions, uh, and we were controlled by the white protectors. Uh, an example uh, I went through was uh, I wanted to go and visit uh, some of my family in the outer islands of the Torres Strait. I recall this vividly, still in my mind was that uh, I got on the boat, I was sitting right in the front of the forward of the boat and I can see the bottom of the ocean, it was, uh, the water was flat as a tack. I can see the fish swimming at the bottom of the ocean and I heard my name called out. It's Danny Morsu here. And I raced up to the priest who was on the boat and uh, he said to me, Danny, you didn't get permission to travel. I turned around and I said to him, no, I got permission of my mum to travel to the outer islands to visit my family. And he said, no, uh, you got to get off the boat. you got to go up to the administration centre to get permission to travel uh, uh, to uh, the outer islands of the Torres Strait. That not only happened in the Torres Strait, but leaving the mission, leaving the, uh, leaving the reservation that, and I was a product of that. Uh, and, it, and that's what the impact it and a lot of our elders today are still living with that memory in the Torres Strait. So true, Denny, and that, that, that narrative's all too familiar to too many of our mob. Becky, in your opinion, why is it so important that people understand the effects of intergenerational trauma? Yeah, I don't think, um, unless you've experienced something like intergenerational trauma, that you can truly understand it. But what I would love for people to be more open about is the listening and supporting when somebody is brave enough to share their story and the effects that it has had on them. I think, you know, as a nation, it's all of our history, not just Indigenous history. And if we as Olympians and aspiring Olympians can go and self-educate, as it's not, I believe it's not our responsibility as Indigenous you know, people to go and educate while we are here for open, honest conversation, respectful conversation. You know, I really encourage our Olympians and aspiring Olympians to go out, educate themselves in this mm. space to really, I guess, honour what it means to represent our country at the global sporting arena. Yeah, exactly. So true. And Patrick, I'm going to come to you now. How important is it for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians to take important first steps in mutually recognising our shared history? Oh, it's, it's crucial. Uh, this day and age where uh, we have um, so much knowledge out there and opportunities to learn, um, we have to come together. You know, it's not always 
um, always saying, well, it's just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. It's actually an Australian issue. And I think the more that we look at that, and particularly around sport and around the Olympians, um, we, we're the role models. We, we, we're people that aspire to. And I feel that as the Olympians, we have the, the opportunity, but also the responsibility to actually understand the shared history that we have and be proud of that and acknowledge the, not only the history, but the proud moments that we've created over the years. And I feel that we, ha we had that opportunity now to be able to come together um, and, and learn from each other. I think it's not a, a one-way street, it's a, a two-way street. And as, as a collective, um, we, we're greater for that. And what will this do for our country, Patrick, in your opinion? What are some of the positives that we can take out of um, understanding this knowledge? Oh, one of the positive is, is actually we, we come together as Australians. I feel we have a, a, such diverse culture within this country, um, but we've got to celebrate that. It's always seen as sometimes a bit of a divide. And I feel that you know, when you represent your country as Olympians, um, you represent the country, but also your family and your culture and, and your background. So we need to celebrate that. And it, it's really crucial that we actually feel uh, that we need to be a part of this process because if we don't, um, then we're always seen as oh, somebody else's issue. Um, but if we come together, particularly around sport, uh, that's a great vehicle of education, inspiring. Um, but as an individual yourself, I feel that you'll grow stronger from it um, because we, we're sharing the same history together. Thanks, Patrick. And thanks to all of our other panel members for who shared that insight with us for our first yarn this evening. Just a reminder that if you have any questions on any of the topics that our panel members just discussed, please put it in the live chat because we're going to get to those later. But now, before we move on to our second yarn, I want to highlight this beautiful artwork that you're seeing here for the first time, Aboriginal art in the theme of walking together was painted by Olympian Paul Fleming, a boxer from Beijing and shows the 52 steps representing 52 Indigenous Olympians and the Torres Strait art, which was, who was painted by George Gavey from the Torres Strait. This is a story reminding us of the impacts of climate change on our environment. Art is so important in storytelling. I'm sure you all agree. There's some beautiful art there and there's really great stories behind it. We're coming to our second yarn, come together in the present. Now I would like to acknowledge our history as, in, as it is important for everyone to understand and it builds context of understanding the disadvantages we see today. This also provides awareness of how this can be linked to the long-term effects of a lack of opportunity, previous generations, including poor nutrition, inadequate education and other disadvantages for our mob so now leads us to our second yarn this evening for our forum, which is titled Come Together in the Present. To come together in the present, we must understand present day issues. To discuss this, we are very fortunate to have with us special guest, Stan Grant. Stan is an accomplished news and political journalist, television presenter, author of several best-selling fiction books and filmmaker. He's one of Australia's most respected and awarded journalists with over 30 years of experience in radio and television news and current affairs. And he's one of my role models. Here's Stan. Tanisha, thank you so much for that. This being NADOC week, I want to pay my respects to my own people, the Gamilaroi, Wiradjuri and Darawal people. I also want to pay respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I'm standing here today. You know, it's remarkable to be here and be part of this and to acknowledge the incredible contribution that our Indigenous athletes have made to our country, to the Olympic movement. Sport, of course, played an enormous part in my own life. When I was a boy, it was our sporting heroes that I looked to. People like Arthur Beetson or Eric Sims in rugby league. Of course, Lionel Rose, my own cousin, Yvonne Goolagong, as she was then, and later Yvonne Corley. These were the people who sustained us. These were the people who gave us hope. The people I look to as an example for what I may be able to accomplish in my own life. They lifted the spirits of a young Aboriginal boy who was living on the outskirts, on the margins of society, moving from town to town with my parents and living an uncertain life, worried about our future. And I'm thinking this year in particular about the Olympic Games of 2000 and that incredible moment when Cathy Freeman, of course, claimed gold in the 400 metres and how that spoke to our country. It spoke to a hope and a reconciliation, but it also spoke to a darker history 
of our country. I was sitting in the stands that night there with my wife and my family surrounded by almost 100,000 other people. And I recall at that huh? time feeling incredibly alone. I felt oh, as if sorry, you got I there? couldn't join in to that celebration. That was before Kathy know, came out to run you. and there was all that anticipation and people were coming together as Australians and I felt apart. I didn't feel as if that really spoke to me. I felt estranged, as I often do, estranged from my own country because sitting between me and my country men and women was all of our history. And then Kathy came out and she ran and we all held our collective breath and she crossed that finish line. And then I saw Kathy run with the Australian flag and our flag, the Aboriginal flag. And in that moment, I could stand with other people. I could be part of that because Kathy gave me back my own country. And you know, tattooed on Kathy are these famous words because I'm free. And I've thought a lot about those words and what they say, what they say to me, what they mean to Cathy, but what they say to all Indigenous people and what they say to all people in Australia. Of course, for Cathy, it was because I'm free to run, because I'm free to explore, to dream, to chase glory. But it said something else. It spoke to our history and how we are trapped in our history. We know as Aboriginal people that we live with a bitter, bitter, dark history, like a heavy weight that hangs over us. More than 200 years since of colonisation and invasion and, of course, massacre and our people pushed onto the fringes of society, rounded up, forced from our land, put onto missions and reserves. For a long time, of course, it was believed that we would simply die out, that we were a doomed race. Then we had to endure government intervention in our lives, control over every aspect of our lives. The government who could tell us where we could live or whether we could keep our children or who we could marry. This was the world I was born into as a young boy, 1963, born in Griffith in New South Wales. All of this history that lived in me, all of this history that shaped me, as I've grown up and I've travelled around the world, I've seen the history of other countries. I've lived in places like the Middle East, in China, in Africa. I've seen the worst of our world. I've seen what history can do to us, how it can pit people against each other, turn us into warring tribes and us and a them. And I wonder about this hold that history has, that we are chained to our past. How do we move on from that? These are the questions we ask during NAIDOC week. We ask about truth. How do we tell the truth of our history? How do we get people to listen? Well, of course, the only way to bring people to our stories, to allow people to see us, is to actually live amongst other Australians, to capture their imaginations. And no one does that better than our athletes. That you're not just running or swimming, or jumping, or boxing, or playing for Australia, you're representing us, and you're representing the best of us. You are the gateway from our society to the wider Australian society. You are a way of bringing Australians into our stories, of allowing Australians to see through our eyes, and in that way, bringing us all closer, so that we can all in some way feel part of this country. So I think again about that tattoo, because I'm free. And it isn't just that Kathy was free to run, but Kathy was telling us something even more profound. She was telling us that there is a way for us to be free from the worst of our history. A history that sits over us, a history that still dooms us, a history that says that our people still die 10 years younger than the rest of the population. We are the most impoverished and the most imprisoned people in Australia, but she told us that there is a way to live free of that history. You can do that. You did that for me as a young Aboriginal boy. It's through you that I'm standing here today. And now you take that to another generation. Again, it's fantastic to be here with you. Thank you so much for inviting me.
Thank you so much, Dan. And that was just an incredible message for our Olympians and everyone else that's watching tonight. Our next guest joining us from Cairns this evening is Dean Parkin. Dean is from the Kwandamooka people of Minjiraba, North Stradbroke Island. Having closely been involved in the process that resulted in the historic Uluru Statement from the Heart, Dean continues to advocate for constitutional and structural reform as Director of From the Heart. Welcome, Dean, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Tanisha. Um, wonderful to be here. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm standing on the land of the Gimwe, Walabara, Yidinji and Yidiganji peoples up here in Cairns. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I bring greetings from my people, the Mwaka peoples from Minjiriba, as you said in your lovely introduction. It's such a privilege to have you here with us, Dean. I just want you to share with us, if you can, the significance of the Uluru Statement and talk to us about the essence of what that statement is and what does it mean to our people? Yeah, I mean, it, it holds a very close um, place in my heart. I was involved in the the regional dialogues that led up to the Uluru Statement from the heart. Um, 13 regional dialogues across the country, so I had the great privilege um, of listening to people, listening to their stories, listening to their ideas, listening to their vision that they had. And I think really importantly, not just for their own communities, not just for their own families, but a bigger, broader vision. And that really flowed through into the Uluru Statement itself. Um, the Uluru Statement does a couple of things. The essence of the Uluru Statement boils down to a couple of things. Firstly and foremostly, it reiterates that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty, First, Nation, First Nations sovereignty has never been ceded or extinguished and it continues to operate in coexistence with the sovereignty of the British Crown. So that's really important. 65,000 years of connection, we're still here, we're still proud and we're still absolutely um, striving to take our rightful place in our own country. Um, the second thing it does is it outlines a few of the challenges still facing our communities. And, and I've heard the panelists talk about those, um, talked about incarceration rates, talked about child protection issues and talked about uh, juvenile justice. And it was important to note that as the Uluru statement process was rolling, so was the, the Royal Commission into the Dondale Detention Centre in the Northern Territory. So that was an issue that was very live and very present in the minds of all the people that were involved in this. It said, though, that this was a unique opportunity for not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but for the nation. And there's a wonderful line in the middle of the statement, which is rarely understood. It says, with substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. And I think it's a wonderful statement of generosity and vision that says, this isn't just about fixing problems for blackfellas. It actually says if we get this right, we'll think differently about ourselves as a nation. We'll think more proudly, uh, more fully of our own identity and how that shared identity has, has, has come to bear. The Uluru Statement then goes through three key reforms, which um, some people may have heard of, voice, treaty, truth. Um, the idea of voice being uh, a voice to parliament, a representative body that speaks to the parliament and advises the parliament and, and government on laws and policies. That voice must be enshrined in the constitution. So it has a special status and protection to make sure that it can continue to exist um, and deal with the issues that we've talked about. Treaty, it's a long held aspiration, a long held goal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And it really comes to this idea of reconciling that existing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty and the sovereignty of the Crown. We haven't had that conversation. We haven't had that agreement. We haven't had that settlement in this country. And so treaty is, is the outstanding business that we must do. And then finally, and, and Stan alluded it to in his, in his presentation, this idea of truth telling. We really need to have this honest conversation with ourselves as a nation. Um, the truth of our pre-colonial history and the truth of the post-colonial history and not just those things that exist in the past or in the history books, but how they continue to have an impact today. And then lastly, and really importantly, and it speaks very much to the topic of, of this panel and this conversation, the Uluru Statement finishes with a statement that, that says, to all Australians, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. 
So it's really important to understand that the Uluru Statement was an issue to governments. It wasn't a petition to governments. It's not a submission to governments. It's an invitation to every single Australian. And it's up to every single Australian to determine what their response to the Uluru Statement is going to be. Dean, whereabouts is the statement at now? It's been a tough three and a half years. Um, let's be honest, change in this country and particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples doesn't come easily or quickly. However, three, three and a half years on, the Australian people refuse to let this go. Absolutely, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have continued to advocate and have continued to lead for it. But the thing I've noticed is uh, across the country, people from all walks of life see this as a very fair proposal. They see it as a practical proposal. They absolutely see it as a unifying proposal that can bring our nation together and that it's time that we made it happen. So at the moment, um, we are running a campaign, a public campaign to help grow that movement of people. And we're inviting more and more people to join and they are. Uh, we understand that 56% of Australians if a referendum were held in June this year would have voted yes in a referendum to support a voice to parliament enshrined in the constitution. That's a very positive position for us to build from. We know the government is in the process of co-designing um, some of the details of what a possible voice might look like. And that will go to public consultation. Those options will go to public consultation in the beginning of December this year. And that's something I'd absolutely encourage all Australians to, to get involved with, to make sure that, uh, that the government hears what, what's important to them and from our perspective, clearly that um, we must make sure that the voice has that constitutional protection that, uh, that the Uluru Statement called for. Dean, how can they do that? How can they make that first step? Because there is so many people that want to walk with us and we're frequently being asked, what can we do? What can we do? What's, what's something that um, you can advise our audience if they're thinking, what's something I can do to get involved? I want to be behind this statement. What can, uh, what can they do? There's two really, really easy things that you can do. Firstly and foremost, read the statement. It's 439 words. It'll take you just over three minutes to get through it. So it's, it's, it's not gonna take a big um, part of your day. It's very simply written. It comes from the heart of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And, and I would absolutely encourage you to read it. And I'd encourage you to read it a couple of times because every single time you read it, you discover something a little bit more and you get a little bit more awareness and a little bit more understanding about what it means. So firstly, read it. Secondly, I'd encourage people to visit our website. It's fromtheheart.com.au. It's very much about raising awareness and understanding about the Uluru Statement. There's a whole bunch of resources there about the history of it, about where it's come from, and about the developments that have happened since the Uluru Statement was, was issued. And by signing up to that website, you can keep in keep up to speed with the latest developments about uh, how that particular movement continues to grow. So read the statement, sign up to fromtheheart.com.au and that's the, that's the way to be involved. Thanks, Dean. We appreciate having you here with us tonight and we're going to get to you a little bit later as well when we have um, all of our panels, panel members back with us for you guys because I know you guys have some questions. You can ask Dean and all of our panel members that we had earlier. We're going to welcome them back as well. So if you've got any questions, drop them in the live chat that's available to you guys because we want to hear from you. And this is a safe space and an open forum for you guys to drive this conversation and ask whatever questions you would like. This leads us into our last segment for this evening and I'd like to share an example of how we could walk together but in this case run together the Indigenous Marathon Foundation saw Olympians come together at Uluru as part of a memorable memorable event let's have a look My name's Lara Davenport. I'm an Olympic swimmer that swam in Beijing as part of the 4x200 freestyle relay. So I'm here with fellow Olympians Brad Hoare, Rachel Spawn and Louise Dobson to participate in a fun run around Uluru to celebrate and support Indigenous culture with Indigenous people from all around Australia. I am also an Indigenous Olympian, which I'm very proud of to be out here uh, in Uluru. It means so much to me and what it means to be out here with all these kids. So we've got about 26 um, 
communities around Australia that are here back to our nice sacred ground and, um, that, and the red dirt that we're on here today. So it means a lot, very spiritual as well. But I'm uh, very proud to be here and um, very proud to be an Indigenous group here as well. I normally run with the group because they, the, the, like, like I said, I love the group. They push me along, they me along because I, I do start a bit with my uh, asthma. But Rachel popped along and I met her along the way and she pretty much took me the rest of the day. Which I was for that. So thank you very much. No, and it was mutual because um, we distracted each other, we chatted, we shared stories, and in no time we're at the finish line, Sean. So if we, we got a sweat up, our toes weren't freezing anymore, and um, we had a lo really lovely chat. And it was um, a memorable morning for both of us. At the start of the fun run we were all a little bit chilly. When you think of the desert you think of the heat but it also is extremely cold just before the sun rises and as the sun's rising. We all came together for the welcome to country. We all linked arms and stood in a circle, took the time to listen to the traditional owners of the land of, of how sacred this space is, how important it is to respect the land that we're on. We were asked at the end of the welcome to pick up some red dirt and to throw that into the air for protection, for welcome and to have a safe journey through our fun run. Rachel and I were running with Desley and Denise from Groot Island and we came across our first challenge which was a hill and we accepted that first challenge by linking arms and, and working together to put in our best efforts to get to the top of the hill. It's so important and amazing to be here in, at Uluru in the spiritual heart and this sacred land of Australia. Uh, to, to pay respects to our First Nations people, to acknowledge that they have looked after this land for over 60,000 years. My role as an Olympian, more importantly, my role as a person to um, listen, to acknowledge, to appreciate difference and to um, share my story and listen to other people's story so we can all inspire each other to be the best virgins we can be, whatever that is. Some wonderful footage and memories shared there. Becky, I remember when I was playing Rugby Sevens uh, for a couple of years, Becky and I went to Uluru as part of the um, Australian Olympics, Australian Olympic Committee. We went there as a trip um, for the Indigenous Marathon Project and it was incredible. Yeah. We had, Kyle was there. Was Patrick there? I don't know if PJ was there. Were you there, PJ? Can't remember, maybe. PJ, did you come along? Well, we had a, yeah, it was absolutely incredible time that we spent up there and that was such a beautiful, beautiful footage and I'm so glad we got to showcase that to you guys tonight. Now, let me just recap what we've covered so far this evening. We discussed the history of our First Nations people, the pain these histories have caused and the transformation of that pain from generation to generation. We then heard from special guests Stan Grant and Dean Parkin to gain further perspective and understanding of the challenges of reconciliation in the present day. We'll now move on to our final discussion, Walk With Us in the Future, where Olympians, our, Olympia, our panel of Olympians is back joining us. Please send through any questions that you have in the live chat. Now I've got some coming. I have the iPad right here and they're flooding in. Keep them coming. Um, and in joining us, I will welcome back our panel. Welcome back Olympians, Carl van der Kuyt, Patrick Johnson, Becky Smith, Denny Morsu and Steve Hooker. All right, I'm going to get the questions underway. And this is actually, this is a great question. This was Shen sent in from Shani. I'll read the question. <laughs> Being so proud to represent my country, I look forward to singing the national anthem loud and proud. But now, with the knowledge I have and how it makes our First Nations people feel, I'm torn. I don't feel the cha that, change one, that changing one word will help. What can we do? Great question, Shani. Patrick, I think I'm going to throw to you first. And if there's anyone else on the panel that would like to go after Patrick on this one, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, and I think it's really important, and thank you for that question. And, 
it's, it's sometimes really difficult because we, we feel a bit vulnerable about asking these questions, but um, you've got to look at the history um, and learn a little bit. And I think create that awareness because once you've had that awareness, uh, you can gain strength and have that understanding that you can have those hard conversations. An example, when you know Steve rang me uh, concerning um, you know what it means to to be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in this country as an Olympian um, and the history about it, 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 was just, it was just an opportunity to talk. And I think if we don't start that first steps of just talking about it, um, then we're never going to actually cross that barrier um, that we are living in this country together as great Australians, but also as the Olympians. And I feel, you know, it's, it's those first steps. You know, we're not saying, look, you have to learn about the whole history of this country, um, but take the steps, talk to the right people. Um, and of course, we as part of the Indigenous Advisory Committee and other Olympians, we want to be able to share this story um, because this is our chance. Um, to walk together, but it's all about social change. Um, you can lead the social change and what you do every day. Um, we can look to other people um, to lead, um, but I believe every Olympian here um, can lead this space uh, and, and seek out, uh, seek out the knowledge, seek out the awareness. Uh, and, and since when Dean mentioned about the Uluru Statement, you know, read it. It only takes around about three minutes, but it's actually a collective a voice from all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders across this country. Um, and I think that sense where we've looked at the video of the 52 Indigenous Olympians, there's some history there. There's some great stories to be told, but I think we need to hear them and listen to them and also hear your stories. Is there anyone else on the panel that would like to add to what Patrick said? Yeah, Shani, Danny from the Torres Strait. Uh, like Patrick mentioned, change uh, takes forever. Uh, especially uh, since colonisation of this country. Um, and in particular, I think the change of the song to our, in relation to our anthem, I think that we need to spend more time actually working through that process and a consultation needs to happen uh, for change and reform. And the consultation has got to start with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. They got to, it's got to be an inclusive process and uh, to get the best outcome for our community. Thank you so much, Shani. That was a great first question to get our part three of our yarn rolling. There's another question here that's come in. Um, how can I find out who the traditional owners are um, on the land that I live on? I'm simply just going to answer this and say it's easy to Google um, where you are living and it'll, and it'll give you a list. Um, it'll, sorry, it'll tell you who the traditional owners are of that country. Also, if there's any Indigenous people in your community, have a yarn with them. Like, get to know the mob that, of this country that you're living on. I think that's really important. Um, and also, there's an um, Aboriginal Land Council uh, in every town, every city. Um, so go check them out. Is there anyone else um, want to have some input in on that? Nisha, Kyle here. Um, I think we're going to hand out some resources to all the athletes, which is one of them is going to be the uh, website for IATSIS, which is the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. But they've got a fantastic map. It shows all the language groups, all the clans, and um, there's, over, there's hundreds and hundreds of different tribal boundaries. So yeah, you can see that on the screen now. Um, go, on, go on, get that map, get, get, get familiar with it. Um, I'm from the Warramai and the Ewan tribe, New South Wales, but yeah, everyone, everyone's so distinct um, from different areas. So go and look up that map and um, you'll find out what country you're on. Yeah, deadly. Thank you for that, Kyle. I have another question coming in here now. What advice do you have for someone who wants to participate in NAIDOC week, um, but is unsure what the first step is? But, yeah. Yeah. That one, again, just simply jump on the NAIDOC website. They've got lots of, um, you know, events happening throughout the, the week and there's still some to follow up for, you know, tomorrow. Um, and also, you know, check out Instagram, Facebook. There's events happening everywhere. If you follow the right pages, you'll definitely find lots of things that you can get involved in. Yeah, cool. Um, we've got another question coming in here as well. We just, I'm going to throw this one to you, Dean, because I know you're a, you're, a, you're a storyteller. He's one of our storytellers leading the way. Why is storytelling so important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? It's the way we pass, it's the way we pass on our truths. It's the way we pass on our heritage and our culture. Um, it's the way we pass on the learnings um, that 
um, that were gifted to us by our parents and, and our old people. Um, I also think at a, just a human level, um, storytelling is really important across cultures. It's the thing that helps us connect. Um, it breaks down all of the, um, in some ways, ideas and, and preconceptions that people have. And one of the best ways to actually find connection um, and find commonality with someone is to, is to share a story. And it strips away titles, it strips away hierarchy. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or it doesn't matter whether you're a community person or whatever, everyone's got a story to tell and everyone's got a story to connect. So um, whatever we do, I absolutely encourage um, storytelling to be part of the way that we share and, and, and try and you know, find those connections amongst each other. If there's another thing you do do after this forum, it's definitely go check out Dean um, on YouTube. He did a TEDx talk on the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It'll give you more context around the statement and it was very powerful and a beautiful piece of storytelling. Steve, I have a question here for you. Um, one of our Olympians has asked us, as a non-Indigenous person, how did you feel asking questions? Um, and how, how did you approach that? And I, I think that's a really incredible question because especially for our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters, it's, we understand that it must be daunting because you don't want to ask the wrong thing. Um, but we encourage you to ask. Um, but Steve, to you, what would you um, say to our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that are listening um, to encourage them to um, you know, be, feel comfortable and come in and have a conversation with us? Um, well, I would say uh, it's daunting to ask, it's daunting to not know, especially when you normally feel so confident in your life and the space that you live to put yourself in this uncomfortable position. But I encourage you to do it because it will give you a lot of insight. And what I will say is the way that it is accepted, um, particularly within our group, within our group of Olympians is incredible. These are amazing people. I'm blown away. The 10 year old me wouldn't believe that I'm sitting next to Kyle van der Kuyk right now. Like, and, and, and we are, that we're colleagues and we're together and the, and the way that they accept um, your lack of knowledge so long as you're trying and trying to be part of the change is, is incredible and it's liberating. Because now I know, normally I'd be terrified to be sitting on this chair talking about these sorts of topics, but I know that these guys have my back. I know that for sure because I, I've already been, you know, through something where I didn't quite do the best job that I could and they were there to support me and lift me up and walk me through the next steps. Uh, and that will be the same for all of you. All of you that are going to Tokyo, um, you are going to be so lucky because the man sitting next to me, Kyle, will be um, part of that team. He's going to be one of the athlete liaisons there. Go to Kyle, talk to him. He's an incredible person. He tells incredible stories and he brings incredible insight to all of these issues. So don't be afraid, be excited to um, start on your journey of, of embracing our shared history. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Steve. I've got another question here from Kim. The 2000 Olympics opening ceremony opened many people's eyes to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It was very different to what we're used to. How did this section come to be? Who led the movement for it to be included? It was amazing and powerful to display to the world and to us. Danny, I think that one's for you. Oh, look, uh, look, it's a great question. Uh, we were part of the AOC, the Australian Olympic Committee Advisory Group to the AOC, and uh, the chair of that panel was uh, Luicha, and uh, she did a fantastic job. And also uh, um, some of the people who was involved was from all, all over the country. Uh, they were involved in the process in terms of pulling that together to uh, demonstrate to the world that uh, we have a a living uh, culture in Australia, and uh, which was uh, inclusive of the, the Olympic AO, uh, AOC strategy was to involve the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through that, uh, participate at that event. And uh, it was a, there was a lot of planning through that process and that uh, process actually took some time to, to happen and uh, it was very, very successful. So, uh, yeah, look, I, I think uh, 2000 uh, was a historical event uh, for us here in Australia, it's for the 2000 Olympics, and I thought that uh, engagement with our community, uh, and it was demonstrated by the Australian Olympic Committee and also the uh, International Olympic Committee as well, was absolutely fantastic. And the icing on the cake was Cathy winning that 400, mate. Go, girl.
It was, wasn't it? Go, it was go. incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just love that it was the whole nation that was screaming for her and backing her. And it was it, that moment in itself was, uh, you know, our country coming together. And it was so incredible and it was so beautiful to see. All right, next question. We have, um, Carl, this one's uh, for you. How important is it um, for Olympians and aspiring Olympians to lead from the front in promoting reconciliation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's been spoken about tonight about just the responsibility and Patty Mills talked about, you know, it's not only just what you do in your sport, but what you can do for the country. I mean, I've got great memories of my races and my performances and just how proud I was, but it's probably been after sport that I've realised the impact that I had, the, the hearts that I touched, the people that I connected with, the hope that I brought to communities and I've been able to travel the country and to hear elders say, hey, we've we seen you on TV, you represented us, you, we were proud. And that, that's really blown me away. I, I've just done my event, I tried to be the best I could at it, but um, to know that I, I really had an impact on people, that, that showed me the, 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 the impact sport can have and the, the, the responsibility that you need to have as an athlete. Um, yeah, a lot of people are watching you and a lot of people are listening to every word you say and how you conduct yourself. So. I, um, you know, that's probably led me into a lot of the roles that I've had now as, as an ambassador and role model. For sure, there definitely is a responsibility that all of our athletes are upholding and you're very supported through that. I have another question here now. Um, what's been some of the most enjoyable experiences um, you've had when visiting Indigenous communities? I'm going to start this one off because um, I'm actually going home to country tomorrow. I'm going back to Garuga, um in northwest New South Wales and... Um, for me, that is very remote and far, far away from Sydney. Um, but it's incredible. The feeling of being on country is nothing like, um, you know, you can describe or explain um, the experience, but you feel it in your spirit and you feel it in your soul. Um, and I'm sure all of our panel can agree with me on this one when you are, you know, on your, like, with your barefoot on your, your country and you just feel at home and it just feels safe um, more than anything. And I know Dean um, and I spoke about earlier when uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart had a youth forum up in Cairns um, and I went up um, as part of one of, as the part of the youth summit and even to be up there um, on Yarrabah country um, was just incredible. It's, it's an experience that like I said earlier, it's one that you'll never be able to describe, but it's one that I encourage everyone that's listening to this forum. Um, if you've thought about going out to community, um, go, have friends that are from a community, or especially when you're in the city. I think when you're in the city, you don't understand how incredible the country is um, and being out in community. It's, if, if any of you guys get the opportunity, I would strongly advise go experience it, have an open mind, have an open heart when you're out there. Um, and be appreciative of uh, the people's country that you're walking on because it's, ex it's an experience that you'll never, you'll never have anywhere else. All right, I'll move on to the next question. Um, what advice do you have for us, uh, for people uh, who want to engage and learn more about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture? Would you like to take this one for us, Patrick? Yeah, I think it's important to sort of um, look at your region or where you're living. Um, as mentioned, there are the land councils, there are uh, opportunities to look on the website and connect. And I think, you know, it's that opportunity, don't be fearful for it because, um, as mentioned, you know, similar to the Indigenous Advisory Committee, uh, we're not scary people. I think uh, being to have that opportunity just to have a yarn, have a talk, um, and that's an opportunity that opens your eyes, um, but it feels that you're a part of something that's bigger, not only through sport. I think we, we had the blinkers a lot of times, uh, but to have that moment where we connect back to country, back to uh, who we are in our soul, in our heart, I think it's not only for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, it's for all Australians. Um, when you have that moment where you can connect back to Mother Nature um, and back to those communities. So seek out uh, people within those communities, but also uh, look online. I think it's important. Um, don't sort of go to a community um, without um, the invitation first. Um, try to connect with people from those communities first um, before you're able to go into that. 
Uh, but the opportunity is there. Like, if you don't ask, you don't talk to people, um, then I feel that we miss that opportunity of a shared um, knowledge, but also the rich history that this country has um, that empowers us, um, not only through sport, um, but it's also a reflection of our life after sport as well. So true, Patrick. Thanks for that. And this one's for all the guests. I know that we've touched um, on a couple of this throughout the forum, but I think it'd be, you know, a good one to leave us on. Um, so this is fresh in all of our athletes' minds, um, aside from what we've already mentioned tonight. Um, is there anything more that our Olympians can do to support the Uluru Statement? Dean, I'll get you to start off talking about this one in a second um, in NAIDOC week. So what's something that they can leave this forum? And um, you mentioned a couple of things, but if you want to reiterate them, that'd be great. Um, yeah, as I said, um, read the statement. It's short, um, and uh, I think you'll enjoy the read and actually and actually learn a lot. Um, secondly, uh, visit fromtheheart.com.au. There's just more information there um, where you can access resources, toolkits, um, stories, articles that really enrich in your understanding of it. Um, and also remember that. Uh, it's an invitation to you as a person, yes, as an athlete, yes, as however you like to receive it. And so think about what your response is going to be. Um, it's, it's not actually about looking around and, and, and waiting for further permission. You need to understand that not every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person agrees with it, and that's okay. We're allowed to have um, different views about these different things too. But there's a standing invitation. There's a standing invitation to you from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to join with us and walk with us in a movement of the Australian people. And uh, that invitation is still there. So I just encourage you to take that up. Um, learn as much as you possibly can. Visit the website. And hopefully um, I'll see you walking side by side as we try and make it happen over the next little while. Thanks, Dean. Becky, you mentioned earlier websites are available for our Olympians to go have a look at. Is there anything else that... They could do this week to, I guess, one step, as we spoke about earlier, um, those who want to know the country that they're living on, go Google that. That's something simple that they can do. Yeah, another simple thing is, uh, you know, see if you can find out how to say hello or welcome in your local community as well, because, you know, language is a, is a very important part of our culture and our history. And if we can, I guess, keep that thriving, that's, that's again, only going to help Australia. Kyle, I'm going to throw it to you. Is there anything else you'd like to add off the back of Beck? Yeah, I think um, I'm just so happy everyone's joined us tonight. And I think now the next step would be, you know, go and find something in your local community that you can connect with. And NAIDOC Week's a great opportunity. There'll be events online. There'll be probably not so many events out there you can go to. But um, I think doing the march, doing a flag raising, finding a local event that you can connect with, um, but don't be overwhelmed because Indigenous people will embrace you. Um, they'll, they'll connect with you and they, they'll want to share stories. So you, you just um, feel confident, don't be overwhelmed. And there's plenty of great websites as too, as Beck said. And, you know, maybe go and connect into a, a, a video or a movie. There's, there's um, some great um, videos on um, NITV and Netflix have got movies on all of this week. Um, so, yeah, maybe just go and sit and watch a movie in your own safety and and that'll be the next step. I also have one actually for all of our people that are in New South Wales and are by the Central Coast. Tribal League is, has been happening over the next few weeks. Kuru Knockout wasn't been, hasn't been able to be played uh, in October due to COVID um, and because we want to ensure the safety of our people and our elders. But Tribal League is kickstarted. It is the first rugby league um, national event of its kind. If you are by the Central Coast, go check it out if you love some footy. If you don't, go check it out and just be around mob because it'll be fun anyways. Denny, I'm gonna go to you. Um, for a, from a Torres Strait Islander perspective, um, is there anything that you would like, um, you know, our athletes advise events they could go this week or some things that they could do? Well, absolutely. We've got uh, a lot of events happening in our at Tugai College uh, up here in the Torres Strait. Uh, there's events uh, within the school uh, to promote NAIDOC week and uh, about our achievements uh, and uh, what uh, a lot of us have done uh, uh, on this uh, uh, telecast tonight is uh, 
and also I just want to say we've got a, a big carnival on this weekend. It's Touch Footy Carnival for the Torres Strait. We've got both men and women's team participating uh, from throughout the Torres Strait. Uh, well, actually started today and are going right throughout the weekend. So the community is excited. They're all pumped up, ready to go. And uh, just in relation to going back to the question earlier in terms of what we can do in our community, uh, what I'm doing now is basically provide support and do it voluntary, of course, uh, support to our younger generation and uh, where I'm looking at uh, working with the community to develop a youth strategy for the Torres Strait uh, to look at what uh, programs you can link uh, from the Torres Strait into a national program and, and, and onto their dreams and aspirations they want to achieve. So I'm doing a lot of support and mentoring around that as well, voluntary. And I'm also looking at uh, uh, ensuring those young uh, kids now coming through our program up here, the basketball program, to excel and achieve their dreams and aspirations like Patrick Mills did. Patrick, how about you? Is anything happening up on the Gold Coast? Um, last question for you. Yeah, there's a lot down on the Gold Coast here. We are doing sort of um, the Yugen Bear language group here, the traditional owners, uh, are doing sort of uh, morning and, and night sort of ceremonies and dances. So uh, there's so much happening, especially in NAIDOC week, but I think it's not only NAIDOC week that you can celebrate, it's, it's every day and, and particularly around this forum, um, you know, you can reach out to us, uh, but also make sure where you live, it's really important that uh, you, you make that attempt. Don't wait um, to, for the invitation. Um, just seek it out um, because I think as Olympians we're very confident but as Steve mentioned sometimes it might be hard to uh, make that first step but I think if you make that first step no doubt no one, somebody else will make that step to you and I think it's, that's how that collaboration, how we work together and how Olympians and Australians we come together because there's no separation when we represent our country, put the green and gold in, we are proud to do that. Um, but we have that diversity, which uh, the storytelling, which is important that all, we can all come together and say, you know, we're part of this great country and it's up to you as the Olympians um, to take that on board and, and celebrate and, and acknowledge, but also um, walk together with us on this journey, which is going to be not only for your lifetime, but for the next generation um, that we're trying to aspire and for this great country of Australia. Thanks so much, Patrick. And I just have to read out a couple of comments that I've had coming through before we um, do wrap up. Shani said, such a great forum with a wonderful panel. Thank you. I'll keep walking along alongside you um, for First Nations, uh, with First Nations people for change. Um, I thought that th these are just really important you know, I guess um, comments for us to hear as a panel because it means that we're having an impact and we just wanted to be heard tonight and we appreciate you guys joining us uh, more than anything. And this forum is also going to be posted um, up on your Olympic forum as well. So you can go back and rewatch it. You can share it with other Olympians that weren't able to get with us tonight. Um, but that comes, that's the end um, of our Walk With Us forum. Thank you so much to all of the Olympians, aspiring Olympians, um, the administrators that joined us this evening. We've had such a wonderful time um, delivering this to you and we hope that you can take some educational pieces out of this. Um, it's been a beautiful night and yeah, thank you for being here with us. I'm going to hand over to Patrick now who's got some final remarks. Thank you, Tanisha. Look, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, really uh, a significant moment um, for the Olympic movement, but also as a collective, uh, I'd like to say a th special thanks to the Australian Olympic Committee, uh, the Athletes Commission uh, with Steve Hooker, uh, Stan Grant, and of course, Dean Parkin, of course, fellow Olympians, um, the Aboriginal Child Child Island artist, George Gabby, Paul Fleming, and of course, everyone that's worked on this together to bring this to you. This is the first ever um, so it's something that we're very proud of and we're looking at actually creating some more forums to have that conversation because if we don't have that conversation, who will? And if we're not going to have to walk together, um, we can't do this to, alone. So it's really important as Olympians and in the Olympic movement that we are united um, to not only celebrate recognition, um, but also who we are as people in this country. So um, I really thank everyone for listening in. Really important. Thank you very much. And we'll just go out and uh, just have that final video celebrating, recognising and acknowledging our 52 Indigenous Olympians. Thank you, everyone.
carried my Aboriginal flag with me and had it in my room. And I never got to do the Cathy Freeman and run around the track with it, but I always say to people, hey, it wasn't it wasn't political um, statement that I had it in my room. It was that's my identity. That's that's my ancestry. That's my history. represent my people, I was very, very proud of that. Set your goals high and work hard. Be disciplined, have the right attitude, focus on your dreams and aspirations to be the greatest sportsman you can be. I was going over the finish line and I remember thinking to myself, so this is what it feels like to be an Olympic champion. I feel very lucky that Dave have paved the way to make my journey that little bit easier to become an Indigenous Olympian. And it inspires me to hopefully do that for our future Indigenous Olympians as well. It's quite simple and it was just to believe in my dream. Um, I believe that I could become an Olympian even when others didn't and not really knowing how but it was that that true inner belief in myself and in my dream that helped me clear the path and show me the way and honouring what we have to say as First Nations people. And 